try to film this with as much natural light as possible. It's a bit of an overcast day. And uh, I like the way this looks. And um, if it starts getting dark, too dark, Last time we were going through the first part of this book, all these pictures, the still frames from all of Kubrick's movies. Segments. 
his friend told him that uh, you could make these things for like $30,000. So when Cooper heard that, he was like, well, I think you can make that for a lot less. I don't remember how much he paid to, uh, or how much he spent to make one, but he went and made one. significantly lower cost and what ended up happening was <laughs> the the news company bought it from him and he barely made his money back I think it was something really ridiculous like he made like 10 to a hundred dollars or something like that back so technically you could call it a profit I think that was the case. I might be misconstruing this or something else. But anyhow, um, the case turns out to be that uh, they really were spending that much money on one reelers. And uh, in fact, they ended up going bankrupt. <laughs> they could not afford the cost. Let's see if I can So something I, I sort of skipped over over here was that um, after making that film, after making some documentaries, he uh, got some cash from his dad, who cashed out his life insurance, and he made a film called Fear and Desire. Desire uh, was a war film. It took place in a sort of fictional war. And uh, Kubrick talks about it like, uh, let's see, I think uh, maybe. Yeah, here we go. This sums it up very nicely. Kubrick says about the film, Fear and Desire, he says, the ideas we wanted to put across in Fear and Desire were good, but we didn't have the experience to embody them dramatically. It was little more than a 35 millimeter version of what a class of film students would do in 16 millimeter. So, wasn't very uh, fond of the picture. He considers it a good learning experience and uh, I think after some more documentary work he, uh, he lands this gig to direct this movie Killer's Kiss. This film is when he first really gets to uh, flex visually. He does a lot of interesting things with the camera and with the light. The production is very small, and in fact, he home every night. And there was a day where everybody seemed pretty grumpy and tired. And so he says, let's all just take the day off. And this actress is like, oh wow. How can you do that? And he says, well, nobody's really getting anything out of this. Except for me. You know, it's kind of an overstatement, but I can understand where he's coming from. So yeah, he makes this film, and then he lands a gig to direct The Killing. The Killing has a big star in it. Oh, I forget his name. Is that George C. Scott? Oh no, 
I'm sorry, Sterling Hayden. George C. Scott is uh, the crazy, I uh, forgot what he is, but he's the real Looney Tunes kind of character in Doctor Strangelove. I guess they're all pretty cartoony, but anyhow, yeah, Hayden Sterling. So this is his first kind of like legit picture that's, uh, you know, going to be what ends up boosting his career more than the other things. And uh, from what I remember, it's, it's both like a critical and financial success. This movie's kind of like, a, it's a heist movie. It has sort of an interesting narrative structure. A lot of kind of intercutting between things. And then he gets two paths of glory. sequence in which a woman sings and that woman eventually becomes Kubrick's wife. Her name is Christian. And uh, yeah, they meet on the set of this film. They have kids together later on. the power to do like a real passion project and first thing he goes to is Lolita now Lolita is already this controversial book by I forget his first name Nabokov 
the story behind Lolita. It is the story of an adult man falling in love with an adolescent girl. And their relationship that unfolds. So, I think in the movie she's supposed to be
some might say spiritual nature to sort of a it's the only picture that's ever allowed me to think about those things because obviously like there's a lot of situations in which I can think about those things but this film is sort of like um, it's only talking about that you know it's not um, it's not very concerned with individual human stories it is more concerned with thing was that the film's release was 
has a steady growth. It did not have extreme critical success. In fact, the critics disliked it very much. For the first, uh, just when it came out, and what was interesting, though, was that there were more and more young people showing up at the theater. A lot of them were showing up on psychedelic drugs. They were dropping acid and watching 2001. The film experienced in the most uh, sober of headspaces, state of mind, whatever, is still a pretty trippy experience. Um, if you choose to dwell on those sort of things, the film would later have extreme critical success and be noted as one of the greatest films of all time. Which is just really funny to watch uh, critics kind of eat their words. So, A Clockwork Orange is based on the book of the same title. And, let's see, I always forget his name. actually experienced a pretty traumatic event. I won't get into the details, but he lost his wife and he sort of channeled all that trauma into the story of Clockwork Orange. Uh, so, the film follows a villain. The story's protagonist is, by most people's standards, uh, morally corrupt. He is a psychopath. He is a violent criminal. He is the main character of this film. And we watch him go through some very radical changes. And uh, the circumstances which cause these changes sort of force you to contemplate um, I guess broadly the idea of how institutions should be used correct people or uh, help people and um, rehabilitate them. The soundtrack is really crazy by uh, Wendy Carlos. his name. So, Wendy Carlos, uh, formerly known as, I think, Walter Carlos, uh, did this score, which is a bunch of classical pieces that have been performed through synthesizers, like uh, Moog synthesizers, giving a strange, timeless quality to them. It's both like modern and timeless. The art direction of the film is also very strange because although in some way undeniably 1960s, it is also strangely out of place in, uh, in history. So, yeah takes place in the future. Barry Lyndon. So, um, at one point, Cooper was developing a biopic on Napoleon Bonaparte. There is a book of that 
which I will eventually get around to making a video of. Uh, the book is entitled, um, uh, like, The Greatest Movie Never Made, or something like that. It's very interesting. Maybe I'll do that next week. So, it fell through, funding fell through, on account of some other Napoleon film being made. People losing interest in period pieces and whatever, a million other reasons. And after that happened, he was still, still sort of like in the mood and was able to use the development to make Barry Lyndon. Now, what I'm telling you right now is never really explicitly, I don't know, accounted by any of his collaborators, or at least I, not off the top of my head, I, I can't really think of that. Uh, so that's my own interpretation of how things went. I think it's a fairly obvious interpretation, but I just thought it was worth saying that that is most part only my opinion. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, uh, him making this movie sort of off the shoulders of the Napoleon movie that he never got to make. There's a typo here, I just realized. It says The Shining was made in 1957. I gotta check that really quick. It was made in 1957. I'm almost certain that it was made in the 70s. Let's see. The Shining film. Jeez. Yeah, it was made in 1980. So that's a typo. The Shining is his attempt at making a horror film. Because there were a lot of horror films that were being made. Which, now that if you think about it, being in 1980, that's exactly when horror films started to peak. Um, sort of 70s and 80s were prime years for the genre, and he decided to step in, take a whack at it. Source material from Stephen King's book, which Kubrick went on to a lot of liberties with the adaptation. A lot of people are upset to add to book adaptations. Uh, I mean, film adaptations of books. And they, what a lot of people expect is a film translation. A word for word, beat for beat translation of the book. But you'll find that in history, the, the best films based on books, or who's, or the best films with the source material from books, are more of adaptations, and there are often uh, creative liberties taken in changing a lot of things, because film and books are not the same thing, you know? famously sort of hates this movie and is very upset at Kubrick for the changes that he made. Um, this guy created the Steadicam. The Steadicam is a system of springs and joints and weights which are used to balance out a camera on this sort of gimbal system so you can run around with it and the image will stay relatively smooth and steady. This was one of the first pictures, if not the first picture, uh, to use a sticky cam system. All that 
guys like salt all the snow is salt
early on, you sort of realized that um, it isn't exactly a film. It isn't exactly a material that you make a film about. Maybe. I don't know. I don't... You know, it's like his stance on this is sort of unclear to me because I've heard that sentiment expressed by his wife, but at the same time, he also did a lot of work on this. And, you know, I'm sure that it could also have done, been something to do with funding and the fact that Steven Spielberg went and made Schindler's List. So, this section is just, uh, this is essays, things that people have said about him. You know, this book is fucking comprehensive as shit. Um, and, you know, I've read through the whole thing, but um, there's just so much in it that every now and then I bust it open and flip to a random page. And there's always a nice little nugget of information that kind of slipped past me in terms of like, I don't know, significance or, you know, I might have just read it and it kind of went in one ear and out the other. Um, it's hard to get sort of a, a bigger picture on on everything the first time you read it. So, yeah, it's a pretty good book. Um, next week, like I said, I'll probably end up doing that, uh, the Napoleon one. Um, yeah, how do you guys like this format? Or, I'm sorry, how do y'all like this format? This overhead kind of thing. As I go into books, it's something I could definitely get on board with because I honestly just want to get more Dash and books. <laughs> um, really deck out my bookshelf with these things. Okay, well, I gotta edit this thing. Uh, hope y'all are doing well. <laughs>